right, so we are uh, today, we are managing text files. We're going to look at a pretty common problem. We'll go ahead and download this letter data and get it extracted. In fact, we'll get that file, we'll get that file extracted. There's only three files in it, but then let's go ahead and make an Excel file right here. We'll start a new Excel file and save it in the same place where those files are extracted. So I'm going to come back to Excel, file new blank, save. Hmm, I don't remember where that was, somewhere in my document. Probably downloads. And I'm just going to call this parse text file. Enter 17. Darn it. It's like the XLSM. And save. All right, and then let's take a look at one of these files. These files are kind of unusual looking files. I'm going to open up, this will open up this first one, Download this one, so the whole thing. We're going to go up one to the front here. Okay. okay. So, looking at this data, and this seems like a really kind of a strange file format to have to read. I mean, today, if you've got some program running and you're saying, I've got to get the data out of this, chances are one of two things is going to happen. One, it's got some kind of export feature, it's got something like you know, export to a common delimited format. Or it's actually just a database application, and you can connect up to that database through Excel or through some other application to get its data. Oh, all that began in the 1980s. Uh, there was still a lot of development that wasn't along this way in the 80s, but in the 80s was a great time. Fabulous music, fashion was a little bit weird, but not too bad. And the hair, I have the hair. Everyone had hair. I had hair in the 80s. My kids look at my high school. I graduated from high school in 1986. My kids look at my high school things like, man, you had fabulous hair. Like, yes, I know. Fabulous. <laughs> but this, this whole idea of being, able, of being able to have the data be separate from the program really starts to take hold in the 1980s. Now, here's the trouble. There's a lot of programs that are out there still running that were written before that idea. Uh, in fact, have you, have you heard of this language? The language called COBOL. Have you heard of it? C-O-B-O-L. stands for C -O Common... Business oriented language. Common business oriented language. Is what it is. Oh, the hideous language. Actually, I took a, I took a class in that when I was a student here in the in the early nineties. And even then, people were going, "Yeah, this language is pretty well dead." Um, I had the lowest grade I ever got in BYU was my COBOL class. It tied for my golf class, B minus in both of those classes. Uh, it was rough. Very few programs still teach COBOL. There's one, Polta, University of Polta. So in their information systems program, you know, they've got a pretty extensive track where you can learn COBOL. These guys leave with bachelor's degrees in information systems making more than $100,000 a year because all the COBOL programmers are retiring or dying. And no one's learning the language. And so it's just a supply and demand thing. There's a couple of schools that are <laughs> supplying and they're expensive guys. But these old programs, why are, they, why are they still around? Why would you be running your business on a program that... You know, it was written in the 1970s. It's older than you are. I mean, it's a lot older than you are. Why would you do such a thing? Yeah, it's a legacy. So we call them legacy systems. So, so, but, but yeah, why? Why would we replace them? Sure, very expensive to switch. It's running. They work. We do what you know, do. What and, and you know, there's substantial risk to saying, "Hey, this is this mission critical system? Let's check it out and replace it with something else." But there's a lot of risk involved with that. Go ahead. They don't need a chance because the business isn't changing much. Yeah, business hasn't changed. Things working could be a government agency. There's not a lot of competitive pressure for this. There's kind of lots of reasons why this code is still around. Here's the problem. These are, these are categorically mission critical systems. If they weren't mission critical systems, they'd be replaced by them. For all mission critical systems, it's the data that we need, but it was never designed to have data interoperability. We never thought we're going to get the data out. In fact, when these programs were written, most of the consumers of the data didn't even have a computer. Right? Every weekend, we 
who would print reams and reams of reports. Have you seen the paper? Hundreds of columns wide, green bar paper, green bar, white bar, green bar, white bar. It's got holes in the side. You pick up one page, and they all come because they're all you know put together. Yeah, people would come around. Here's your reports for the week. You know, we got a, every Monday morning, we got a cart. The guy's got a cart. It's like a shopping cart. He's going around. He's delivering people all these stacks of paper. And every once in a while, the company would be like, you know, it's really expensive to print all this stuff. What do we really need to print? You know, so we, we send out a survey. Do you really need these reports? What's the answer? Yeah, we really need these reports. And so you know what they start? They start doing. Oh, when I stop right here, all my voice bounces off the wall at the same time. Uh -huh. So companies would start like, yeah, you know what? Just um, for that division, don't give them any reports. Just quit giving them reports and see which ones they really, really need, because they'll tell you, hey, where's my report? It's like half of them people don't even really need, but we're printing them. And anyway, there's old style stuff. So now, today, what are we going to do? How are we going to get that data out? Well, some very bright person said, these things are only designed to print. There's no export feature. Um, could we write something to export? Maybe, but you know, it's working. We're not quite sure what will happen if we start playing with this stuff. Plus, no one knows how to work the code anymore. It's just there. So we're going to live with it. Well, someone said, look, let's invent a printer, a new kind of printer. Instead of printing ink on the paper, it prints bits onto a file. So the old system can look at this and go, oh, it's a printer. I can print to this. And instead of printing paper, it makes files. So that's exactly what we're looking at. We are looking at a file that was intended, but the program that generated this thought it was printing it to paper. The people that, that wrote the program never imagined that it was going anywhere but paper. When we created a new printer that will allow us to create a, a file to get, this, to get this data out in an electronic format that we can work with. Ah, oh, great. Now we can email these reports around. But what if we do if we have to graph this data? So let's take a look at this data. This is actually this is a fairly common, pro, fairly common problem. In the last class, just an hour ago, you know, a student goes, oh my gosh, this was exactly my internship. That's what I had to do. They gave me these reports. They look just like this. And I had to go through and, and get the data out into a format in Excel that they could work with. So anyone, what can you tell me about this file? What are we looking at here? What is this? Good heavens. Can you tell me anything about this file? What's that? It's weather data. This is actually precipitation data from where? Yeah, it's Brazil. And so you know these are like, I don't know, I think this is a state, some state in Brazil. This is either a city or the name of a weather station, but this is somehow the name of. That's a month? November is a month, I got that. Is that how you say, spell November in Portuguese? This kind of looks like English. Is that Portuguese? Like English report for Brazilian weather. Monthly. Yeah, this is all this is all Brazil. And the numbers are clearly English. These are English numbers, yeah, so I get that. Idea. So. Yeah, so that's what this is. Um, so data comes out. We've got to you know, now suppose that you had to graph precipitation data. Here's your file. Graph it. What are you going to do? This would be terrible to have to work with. So what we need to do is we need to be able to find a way that says, okay, we've got to make some procedure that looks at this exported data and comes in here and says, all right, we've got to create a line in Excel that says. Uh, let's see, the 3rd of November, 2008, in this particular weather station, oh yeah, it says station right there, with this number, there were three millimeters of rain. On the 2nd, there was just a trace, maybe, maybe we put that, I don't know what we do with trace, here there was none. And we'd like to be able to build a table that has all that information, just data, at that point, we could probably make a graph without too much trouble. But going from here is going to be a nightmare. And so that's the, that's the task, that's our task for today. We go through the procedure that can do this. And we're looking specifically then, so today is really about parsing text files, opening text files, being able to read them, and, and so forth. So are we ready to do it? That's a kind of weak clap. All right, let's get down to it. So uh, I've got a brand new file here, and I have saved it in the same location where those text files are. And. Oh, I still have my salt. I still have my custom. Uh, I made an add-in last class. Let me go remove that add-in. Okay, here's my meditation add-in. I should do, take a breath, observe your surroundings. That was helpful. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that add-in um, because it's, it's 
still showing up in my code, so I can do so. Let's see, one more option. Is that parse text file on my PC? Do we need that? Oh, no, it's a brand new workbook. It's a brand new workbook that I saved. Yes, I don't try to download that. Just make a new workbook and call it somewhere. Custom ribbon W17, don't need that, okay. Um, I, met, I told my wife I made a meditation tools in Excel. Yeah, she was so proud of me. Uh, okay, here are parse text files. Not from explicit work. Well, this is from my funk or something. So I'm going to come to parse text files and insert them. <laughs> So, for your database modification project, you've been through the gory details of saying, I want to go somewhere, look at a list of files, and then process them one at a time. So in past semesters, I've done this example before we got to that, and so we would normally start with that, but you've already got that, so we won't spend time on that. Instead, we're just going to create a procedure called parse text file, and we will send it the file path that we want to work on. Now, we'll need some way to execute this because now that we've got a parameter on this procedure, we can't run it. I try to say run F5 and it goes, what do you want to run? We can run. There's nothing runnable here. And so we're going to give it another procedure. We'll just call it a test. And we'll call parse text file and we'll pass it this workbook's path. Concatenated with and then one of these file names. Now, if we look at this particular file that we're on here, it's only got three days. And the way that this data is set up is it's going to give you a week's worth of data as long as that week is entirely within a month. And so here we've got November 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. So this is probably a uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But we're not going to have part October, part November. It would split that into a, different, into a different report. So rather than work with this one that only has three on it, I'm going to open up one that's got all seven days. This 11 should have all seven days. It's 2008 X11. And I'm going to open with. And that's the file then. I've got it open here so I can take a look at it. But that's the file that I'm going to be sending through to, uh, to work. So now when I call a test, it will just call parse text file and send it a file to work with. And then ultimately, you know, we have some other procedure that finds all the files we have to work with and pumps them into this procedure one at a time. Questions on what we've done so far? Okay, so now, now we need to open that file and start to work with it. So let's take a look. We, not too long ago, we opened the text file. We're taking a similar approach um, the syntax will be similar, but instead of reading the whole file at once, we're just going to read a part of this file at a time. So let's see what we have to do. I'm going to declare a variable called ff. Actually, let's come back to that in just a second. Let's just go ahead and open the file. Open, and then file path. So whatever has been passed in here is what I'm going to open. For input, as number one. And then I will close number one. <coughs> the whole idea behind this number one business is that we're saying, we have four or five files open at the same time. We're going to just keep track of them differently by saying, well, one's number one, one's number two, one's number three, one's number four. And that has to be, that number has to be unique, like throughout all my code. If I call another sub procedure and open a different file, I can't open file number one there as well. And so it got, to, it got to be a problem keeping track of which file was which number, and, and it was kind of ugly. And so they added a thing to the language that, that you could say, hey, what's, I don't care what number this is. What's the next possible free file? And so I'm going to call, I'm going to declare a variable for that. I'm going to call this input file as an integer. It's just going to be to keep, to keep the number, keep track of which number I'm using. And instead of having this number one hard coded, I'm going to ask, hey, what is a valid, what's a, what's a valid file name? What's a valid file number? 
So I will say input file equals free file. And that just says, hey, what's the next valid file number? We'll use that one. I say, I don't care what the number is. Just, I want to think of this as free file. So instead of saying as number one, I will say as number input file. And then I will close number input file. Now, yes? Question? So, okay, so let me just go ahead and I'm going to run the code right to here. So now it's it's already run what, what free file is. And remember that all, all free file is doing is it's saying, you need a number to keep track of this file? I'll give you kind of the next valid number. DBA knows which files are currently open. How many files do I have open right now? I haven't opened this one yet. How many files are open? None. And so what's the next valid number that I could use? It's number one. And that's exactly what free file says. Free file just says, oh, file number one, that's the next number you can use. And, and the whole point is, is that if I'm, if I'm manipulating lots of files, especially if they're happening in different sub-procedures and I'm calling one from another, keeping track of what numbers I'm allowed to use in different places is really a problem. And we don't really care what the number is, as long as it's unique to be able to, so that Excel can keep track of which file that we're supposed to be writing. So that's all it is. So now I'll use input file instead of one to refer to the file that I'm working with. So let me declare a variable called data. I'll make this as a variant. I have something else in mind for it. It would work okay as a string right now, but let's start off as a variant because I think we need it for variant later on. What we've seen before is that we could say, you know what, I just want to read this whole file into memory. I would do that by saying data equals input. And then I've got to give it two parameters. How many characters I want to read, and then which file I want to read it from. Well, I want to read it from input file. How many characters do I want to read? I want to read all of them. There's a function that tells me the length of the file. I tell which file number, it tells me how many characters there are. It's called LOF, length of file. And then I plug the file number in there. And so if I run this, that will now have read that entire file into my variable called data. Come here to my immediate window, I can print data. print, data, and here it is. Here's, here's that file. Media window only has 200 lines, so I don't have a whole file showing here, but I've got access to that data. And that works okay if I'm dealing with small files. But what's the limit? How much data can I put into a string? I mean, when we talked about string, that's what it was a whole lot. I mean, you, could, you could fit thousands upon thousands of, of copies of the Book of Mormon into one string variable. It's four, it's four gigabytes. How many of you have seen a text file bigger than four gigabytes? They're out there. That's a pretty big file. And so if I've got a file that won't fit into a variable, a memory variable, then I don't have the choice but to say I can't read the whole thing at once. And so let's take a look at, what it, at, at the process of reading this one line at a time instead of reading it as all into one particular variable. So I'm going to get rid of this. I'll finish running this out, and let's take a look. So instead of reading the whole file, I'm going to read one line at a time. So I'll create a variable called one line as a string. And so now, instead of using input, I'm going to use the line input statement. Line space input. Then say pound sign the number of the file, comma, and then I then I put the variable I want to read the data into, and that's one line. This seems a little bit strange. Normally, when we work with moving data around, we've done it this way: some function is going to return some data, we're going to assign it into a variable. This one works different. We pass it the variable we want to populate with the data, and it says, "All right, we're going to go read a line off that file. We're going to put it into this variable." So now, if I, if I put a breakpoint on the end sub and run this whole procedure, <coughs> I should be able to ask what one line is. And 
it's just the very first line off of that file. WSI Corporation Monthly Precipitation Tabula. And that is, in fact, the first line. Okay. Questions so far on what we've done here? What is it that the stop does? The stop's just on the very, just on the very last, yeah, it's on the end sub. And the whole idea is I wanted to see what's in that variable. If I run past the end sub, that variable will be released back into the wild. Data will be. Okay. So now let's start to think about, so that's, a, that's like the nuts and bolts of doing this. Let's now think about what we're going to do to, to read this data, actually assemble this data the way we do it. So I'm going to go back to the data. Let's take a look. So where, where is the first piece of information that I need? i got to keep track of what, what day of the year this participation happened and where did it fall. That's what I'm after. So the first piece of information I need is right here. This is all going to be from November of 2008. So how am I going to get it? Well, first thing is, at this point, I've only read the first line. It's not on the first line. So let me at least get, let me at least get a staff file. I am going to, we got line input there, another line input. Reading the next line says, all right, we read that line, know whatever we want to with it. Now we're ready to read the next line. And so at this point, we'll have to put a breakpoint here on before we close the file. At this point, I run into here. F5 to run, and my procedure. And I look at one line now, we should have that second line. We've got it right here. What happened to the first line that I that I put into that variable first? Poof, it's gone. I wrote right at the top of it with the second line. So the second line has to be memory top location. So, looking at this data, how are we going to figure out, how are we going to get the month and year off of this line? I've got this whole line now sitting in a variable. It's got to be something that's going to work for any file that I pass to it. So, I don't know if it's going to be June to whatever, but this is, I've got to be able to get that month again. Month again. So, from what you know already with VBA, how would you do it? How are you going to get the month and year? Ah, I, I think that's pretty good. It would be the first dash. You know, I'm, I, I'm not sure I would want to go to this character position because, you know, what if it says January here instead of June? It could push this whole thing over. But if I look for the first dash, I think I'm okay. Do I think a dash is going to show up here in the middle of, in the middle of some month's name? We're going to start hyphenating our months. Well, you know, I used to be May, but now I'm known as May, November. We had a <laughs> marriage here. And hyphenated month? No. So, um, yeah, I like it. So, let's go ahead and set up a couple of variables to keep track of that. So, I'm going to declare uh, something to keep track of that month and year. I'll call it Moyer, M-O-Y-R, as a straight. And let me also kind of keep track of where I'm working. I'm going to declare a variable called POS, short for position, as an integer. So I'm going to find out where that hyphen is, and then I'm going to use that to, to get the month and year. So if I think about this, how far in, I'm going to, actually I don't care how far it is, I'm going to find that, and that'll tell me where that is. So, we've got the line input at this point, we've got the line that we're after. Let's just say that position is equal to in string, start the first character, look at one line, look for a hyphen. And that will give me that position. I could just go ahead and drag back to that line and run again. And position is now 18. Great, it's the 18th character. Now, how many characters do I need to take? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Take seven characters. I'm guessing that all these months are going to be abbreviated to three digits. I think that'll be okay. So now, Moyer is going to be equal to the mid of one line, starting at position and taking seven characters. Hold 
on that. Take a look at it. And that's now holding hyphen November hyphen 8. Hmm. Do I want that leading hyphen or do I just want November of 08? Ultimately, I'm going to be taking one of those days that I had down below there. I'm going to squish it on the front of this. I'm going to want to have a whole date that I'm recording. And so I think I want to leave that hyphen there. If I don't have it there, I'll just put it back in later. So I'll just, I'll just use that one. You never know when you're running out of hyphens. We've got to conserve our hyphens here. Throw it away because we want you to use it again. All right. So step one accomplished. We've got the month and the year now recorded. I mean, we've got, we've got that. Now. It turns out, I don't care, on this first block, the way this is organized, this first block is telling me percentage of normal. So for June of 08, we had, I'm not even sure I can read that. We don't need this stuff. We're after this next block of data down here, which is the actual raw numbers. This is how much, this is how much, how many millimeters of rain we recorded at this particular station on November 4th of 08. So we've got the November of 08 figured out. So the next piece of information we need is going to be the days of the month that we're recording this for. So take a look at the data. How am I going to tell? Remember, I only need to see one line at a time. Now, I could find a particular line and say I've got to move on a few lines from that. But as I'm looking through this data, seeing one line at a time, how am I going to tell when I've got to the right line? What's you, is there anything unique? If I can find something about this line that's unique, that would be perfect. I'll just read and tell you that the uniqueness of this line. Alternatively, if I can find some other line that's, that's unique, and I know it's like three lines past that, I can do that. Wait until I find this line, and then read three more lines, and then I've got the right one. What do you think? Take a look at the file. What do you think? What's that? Okay, so one, one thing would be to say, you know, I've read to write, so far I've read to write here, and we see these equal signs, that's pretty tempting. But unfortunately, that's kind of like at the head of every block. So I could like read past a couple of lines to get past this one, and then keep reading until I see these equal signs, and then know I've got to go one, two, three more lines to get the data that I'm after. That's a lot of work. It would work, but there's an easier way. Yeah. This one right here? Okay, so a line where the last non spaced character is a percent. I would do it too. Yeah, so that's a little bit better because that, that will just let me scan right down until I find this and then I know it's the next line. Possible, there's a better one. Anyone in class named Norm? Anyone here named Norm? You get a gold star for the day. Because it turns out that the only place that Norm appears in the file is at the very end, the last four characters of the line that has the data that we're after. So what we're going to do is a simple loop that says, hey, just keep reading lines until you see the one that says Norm. So let's do that. So before I close the file, we'll come in here and say do and loop. We're going to loop until, we'll put, we'll put a do up here on the, I don't remember, the bottom here. Loop until, until what? Until the rightmost four characters of one line is equal to norm. Now, we haven't got a loop. I'm going to go ahead and put my do events in here just in case things get out of control. I'll let me let me break in. I'll do something that will change what is in one line. We'll just read another line. So now, this looks pretty good. I'm going to keep reading until I get to the line that's got Norman. And that will let me off of this loop here, and I will have that line in memory. So I don't think I need any other space in here. That's it. Just keep reading lines until I see the one that says Norman. One line is up online. Yeah, it's probably pretty hard from where you're sitting to see that E. Let me darken that E in for you. So you can see it. So I'll run that now. And so hopefully, if I look at one line, yeah, I've got, that's the line I'm after. So I've got it. So far, so good. Whew. How many of you are looking at this process and going, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. This is what it takes? This, this seems hideous. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, but if it was easy, 
They can pay any old chunk to do it. Instead, they're going to pay you. Yep. How is line input keeping track of where it's at? And can you access that number? How is line input keeping track of where it is, where it's located, where it's, where it's being conducted? So here's what happens. If I were to look at this, if I were to look at this file, if I could only see this file with the computer's eyes, I'm looking at a notepad. A notepad says, we want to make this for human eyes. But if I could look at this with computer eyes, what I would see is that you know, there is a, there's a character number here. It's actually character number 32. There's a 32 right here. It says, this is character number 32. And when Notepad shows character number 32, it goes, oh, yeah, let's make that look like a space. Just don't show anything there. But it's yeah. It gets over here to capital W, and that's something like, I don't know, something like 100. That's character number 100. The computer sees that as character number 100. Notepad says, we've got to make these poor humans look at this, so let's make it look like a line that goes up and down and up and down. Or down and up, down and up. And then they'll know what we're, that we're talking about. See what I'm saying here? At the very end, as I'm going through here, it's, it just comes, the computer's looking at this. Is this the next character, the next character, the next character? It gets right up to here, and it doesn't, it doesn't say, oh, this is the other line, we're moving down. It just sees another character. It sees character number 13, which is a character term. The line is character term. And right after it, it sees character number 10. Line feed. And it goes, aha! Carriage return line feed. And, and, and notepad says, the next character after that, which is 32, let's just put it on the next line down so a human can see it. So the way the computer keeps track of it is it's reading one character at a time and it's streaming it out. It's putting it out when we request it. It hits the, 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 the character sequence that's right here that's 13 and 10. And it goes, don't send the 13 and 10. But, but stop. And it says, I'm right here. And just remember, that's where it is. Is there any way for us to ask exactly where it is? There's no way. We can't say, hey, where are you right now? It's not going to go on the character 32,473. Because it's, it's not thinking about that. It's just reading until it finds the next character turn and it sends it back. Got it? Question? Yes. Okay, so here's the question. So the question is, hey, Excel's got these fabulous tools for converting CSV files. Like, you got a, a text file? Look, just read it as a CSV file and it'll import. If it is a CSV file, comma, separated variable file, if it conforms to that convention to say, here's a standard way to store data, then Excel's going to read that in beautifully. There's no way that I would take this approach to read a CSV file because Excel will do it, it will do it faster. More reliable, I don't have to think about it. But this isn't a CSV file. And Excel is not going to import this very nicely at all. In fact, if we told Excel to import this, the closest thing we could do would be a, a fixed width variable field. You want to see what that would look like through the import process? Let's just go ahead and do it. It won't take long. I'm going to stop my code here. Let's just import it. And you'll see, and so you'll see the problem that we're trying to work around. So I would come over here to data, uh, get external data. From text, here's the file I'm after. It kind of brings it up. Looks still not too bad. I'm going to call it fixed width. Uh, great. I'm going to put the lines in here that says you know where I want to where I want to split this. It doesn't even it doesn't even get me. It doesn't even show me the data. Oh yeah, that's here. Okay, here's the data I'm after. So I could say, hmm, I better move this line over a bit. Move this line over a bit. Move this line over a bit. Oh, I need a line in here. I need a line here. Move this line over. So forth. I've now isolated these data that I'm after. Say next. It's going to ask me for some information about this. I'll just go ahead and finish it off if you want to put it right here. And so if I come down to the data that I'm after, this block of data is okay. It did a pretty good job bringing in this data. It's all lined up. But I don't have. You know, I'm still kind of in the same situation. All I've got is my numbers here. I can probably split these out okay as well. But now I've got all of this other stuff here that's completely mixed up. And I've still got to come in here and find my November of 08, which now has been chopped up. 
So if we were processing this by hand, if I only had to do this file once, this is probably how I would do it. You know, I'd come in here and I'd just throw out the data that I don't need, throw out the data. But if this is a process I've got to bring it in all the time, I definitely want to say, let's set something up that will, let's look at that file, bring the data in, and not have to read it. And, and, and we could do this too, right? We can get here, and then we could work with the, we could work with the data here. We could go find this cell, put these two together, that's what it is. And so, yeah, and the reason is, this was this is not a data export file. This is a file meant for humans to consume. All right. So uh, we've got we're now holding the line. I'm going to go ahead and run back to this point. We are now holding the line. We're holding this line. One line. And the information that I need out of this is right here. I need the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And it might be, you saw the other one, it was one, two, three. I need whatever data is in here. Any thoughts about how we're going to look at this line and get to those numbers? Find the minimum number on this. I would do it. It's kind of a difficult thing to do. It's easy to say, a little harder to do. Okay, so we could like go character by character until we found a number. That worked pretty good. Wouldn't be too bad. Easier, easier way to do it. In fact, based on what we just saw over here, this should kind of tip you off as a really easy way to do it. These numbers are always in the same position. It's a fixed width format for this block. And so what we can do is we can just say, you know what, I'm going to count in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 20 characters, and then I'm going to take the next 40 characters, and then that will be, that will bring that, we'll get that data, right? And that's going to be just one statement that does it. So right now, that's what's sitting in one line. So, we'll note here, read the days into a variable. So I'm going to say, oh, have I created the variable called days yet? I've got, I've got data as a variable. We'll use that shortly. I now want to create days also as a variable. Here's what I'm going to do. Days equals e -A -Y -S, equals the mid of one line starting at the 20th character and taking 40 characters. So now I've run to that point, and I'm going to ask, hey, now we're at this point, what is in days? Here it is. But what's the trouble? We've got all these extra spaces in here. I've, I've isolated those days, but now I've got to somehow look at those and say, all right, I've got to do something with the four, and then something else I'm going to do with the five, and then the six, and then the seven. Right now it's all sitting in one string. What should I do? Of all the mind-boggling tools I have given you throughout this semester, what's going to help us look at the string and say, take this thing and make it into take this one thing and make it into seven different things? Yeah, I got a function called split. So now, what's what are we going to do with split? Split says, give me a delimiter, and I will take a string and I will cut that string up into many strings and array of strings using that delimiter. What's my delimiter? Space. Here's the problem. Right now, it'll say, great, you've got there's a the delimiter there. And so before this is your first entry, what's before that? A zero length string. What's right after it? Before the next space? Another zero length string. We have a bunch of zero length strings. Then I'll have a four, a few more zero length strings, a five, a few more zero length strings. I have this huge array. I don't want that. I just want an array with just the numbers. What can I do? Trim it and then split the number. One trim, what do you mean trim? Let's take a look at trim and BBA. By trim days. Pretty good, got rid of the leading and the trailing, leading and trailing spaces, but I still have multiple spaces in here. White Oh yeah, there was something like that in, in the uh, parsing class that I wrote. We don't have that up here. Yeah, so. Say that again? Oh, that's a pretty good idea. Can't we just tell it, hey, the delimiter is one, two, three, four, 
So the perimeter is one, two, three, four, four spaces. That works pretty good. Uh, except there's only three here. And so, yeah, if there was always four spaces, and that's the whole reason we got four spaces in there. I said one is because I need, I need some padding in there for one that it takes two digits to show the day. Think back to Excel. Is there a function in Excel that would do just what we want? It's like cell wizards, aren't you? What is it? Replace. We can do some kind of iterative thing with replace, where we say find two spaces, replace it with one, and keep keep on doing that until there's no more instances of two spaces. Yeah, you guys just don't know this function. It's a great function in Excel. In fact, it's called trim. But the trim function for Excel works differently than the trim function for DDA. Watch this. So instead of DDA trim. I'm going to come in here and say uh, workbook function. Well, that's what you said, but I wasn't sure which one you were talking about. Workbook. Did I spell that wrong? Workbook. Dot. Oh, it's probably worksheet function. Worksheet function. Dot. You may have to be done C T I O N dot there we go. Dot trim days. And that's in this graph. So trim inside of Excel, the Excel trim is for the leading space, trailing spaces. You got multiple spaces inside, collapse them down to a single space. It's just exactly what we want. Somebody was thinking when you wrote that function. They're probably thinking about this very problem. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say, you know what? I'm now gonna change days from what it was, I'll just, I can do this all in one statement, it'd be one long ugly statement. Instead, I'll do it in multiple ones. Days equals worksheet function trim of days. And now, here's the reason we made it variant. I'm going to say days equals split days. Everything up to this point, we could have done with a, everything up to this point, we could have done with a string variable. But now that we're taking the, now that we are going to we're going to send back an array, we have to have a variant type. You're used to saying, to passing it the parameter, I want to split on the comma, I want to split on the pipe, uh, I want to split on the space. But the parameter is optional. And the default, this, this default parameter for the delimiter is a space. So if I just say split days, we'll split it based on the space. So now I'll run these lines again. And I should be able to come here and say, I want to see days, now sub zero. There's the four, sub three, there's the seven, and so forth. So we now have we created an array of exactly the right size to be able to hold however many days there are. And it won't matter if there's one day, seven days, four days, three days, whatever. We've got the array of the right size. Beautiful. Okay, so at this point, then, we have taken care of pulling in this data. So, what do we need next? You know what, I'm going to bypass the state. We could bring in the state. But let's just go ahead and go straight down to our line that's got the data in. So, an easy way to do this, and I think we're okay, is just to say, you know what, there's going to be a line of equal signs, a blank, the name of the state, a blank, and then here we are. So, I've got this line, I want to read one, two, three, four, five, and I'll have the next line that I'm after. So we'll just read those five lines. We won't be looking at the lines or anything, we'll just say, look, blow past the next four lines and read the fifth one and then stop. So let's give ourselves a variable for that. We'll get right to you. Let's give ourselves a variable for this. Uh, dim, dim x as an integer. I'll put a comment here, advance. A, B, D, A, and C, D, 2 of data. For x equals 1, 2, 5. Next. And we just want to read, just do a line input inside that little box. Oops, this needs to be before we close the file. So let me read that, and then I'll take the question. Let's see what we've got now in one line. 
Yeah, we've got the we've got the data that we're after. Go ahead. Did you think the question was days of variant? Days is a variant. So we made a variant so that we could pull off this stuff right here, which is to take a function that returns an array and then bind that variable, that variant variable, onto the array that this returns. Okay, so now there are several pieces of information we need off of this line. We need the name of the weather station, we need the call number, and then we need the actual data. Well, let's, go ahead and, let's go ahead and pull the data first because the data, the data is exactly like pulling the dates. They're in the same columns, in fact. So I'm just going to copy this block. Here I've advanced to the data. Now I'm just going to, I'll just do a find and replace. Look for days. Replace it with data. That's all. Five. That's great. So now I'm just. I now have a. a, a, a I have an array called data. It's exactly the same size as my days array, and it's got my precipitation data in it. So I've got these parallel arrays that will let me kind of match those up. I'm going to need the station and the call number, so let's create variables for those. Stem station as a string. Stem call number as a string. And then let's think about how are we going to read the station. It might be helpful to come over here and look at the file. Again, I can look at this and I can see, wow, all these call numbers, they line up right in the right column. So we've got a fixed length structure here. So it looks like I can just say start the second character and take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And that will get me my station. Start the 14th character and take 5, and I've got my call number. So zoom in. Let's go ahead and do those. Advanced to the data, station equals the mid of one line, starting with the second character, taking 12. Let's go ahead and trim that using the regular VBA trim. Let's get rid of leading and trailing spaces. Call number equals the mid of one line, starting at 14. And taking five. There's my station. There's my call number. I'm feeling pretty good about this. In fact, I think I've got now all the data I need to record the first week from the January station. Whew. Now the question is, where are we going to record? We can record this in Excel pretty easily. Should we do it there? Or should we open up another text file and write it out to another text file? <laughs> no, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it's actually not a lot of work at all. Okay. <laughs> what do you want to do? Want to write to Excel, bring it to Excel, or do you want to write it out to another file? Who says another file? Who says, can't we just end the class now and go home? <laughs> That's us. Yeah, you know what? Well, if, there's a few, I looked. I looked at attendance today. There's a few of you with exactly six absences. You know, you're down. You're here for the rest of you know, for the duration. Okay. But the truth is, you've already recorded your attendance. You could go anywhere. All right. Let's go ahead and bring it into Excel. To do that, I'm going to need to, to, to have a row, that, a very little defect with row I'm looking at. So let's dim row as a, an integer. Uh, and then right first thing, let's go ahead and figure out what that, where that row should start. So let's say row equals, and we'll just work on the active sheet. Cells, rows.count, uh, column number one, we want to end Excel up. We've done this several times, so I'm guessing you can follow this. I want the row that brings me, and I want to add one onto it. That should be the next available row 
to write data to. So we declared a row variable, and we said, all right, figure out where that row is going to be. Let's skip this line and just actually you know, set it to 1 if you wanted to. That would work for us. But it would just be you would write over the top of your existing data if you brought more data in. We've got the data now. We're ready to write that out. Well, listen, we, we've got seven days in our days file. We've got to write out seven rows. We've got to write out January uh, this uh, call number, this date, this much precipitation. That's one day precipitation. I've got to do the same thing for the next row with the next day data. So we'll just use the size of the day's array to control that. 4x equals 0 to the upper boundary of days. 4x equals 0 to the upper boundary of days. And here's what we want to do. We want to write out. We want to say cells, row number, row, Call number one, dot value, equals a station. Same row, column number two, dot value is the call number. Number, column number three's value is going to be, let's put the date in there now. So put the date, food. We've got a day's array which holds the day, so days sub x, that will give you the 4, but now I want to concatenate that with my month and my year. So that should give me 4 hyphen November hyphen 08. Now we just need to plug the data in there in column number 4. And so that's going to be data sub x. And so, however many days we've got, we're going to write out the same station and call number. We're going to put in the day and the proper year with the data. We're going to write those out each time. We better increment our row here. So, row equals row plus one. <laughs> so, row starts out as two. The next time through this will be three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then, where do we want? Ooh, I like it. We already have the station. The station is filled in. So, I should be able to. Hmm, I haven't, I haven't executed my row. So right now, row is zero. So let me just see if I can set that to two to get, my, to get me started. Row equals two. Hmm. Very well not creating this context. I'm going to have to stop my code and run it again. Stop, F5, run. And now then, let's take a look at our worksheet. Oh, whoops. It's going to be at the end of all of this. I'll plug it in down here. Let me go ahead and clear this worksheet off and we'll try this one. a couple of students who said, you know, you can record attendance, you can leave, could be seriously done. Wait until he's looking down. <laughs> so there we have it. We've put in the data. We've got the nine millimeters. It sounds like we've got the nine millimeters. We've got the nine millimeters of rain here. We've got the eight millimeters here. And so far, so good. A lot of work to get that first line. But now, the heavy lifting's done. Now it's just a matter of saying you've got to figure out how to control this loop to go and do it over and over again. So let's ask ourselves. So any questions at this point? Can you show you the code? Where's the top? Do you want me to zoom in or can you see? Okay. Okay. That's great. Got a picture of it. Oh, you can zoom in. <laughs> okay. So now, I'm going to try to look at this kind of overall. So let me leave this small for now. So let's see. Let's just kind of review what we've done here. We found the line that got us our days. In fact, now that we've got the days, we've got the days for the whole file. We don't have to do that again. We're reading the days. Here we're advancing to the data. I think just before we start advancing to the data, we want to put a do loop. So I'm going to put a do right here before our first for next loop, and then I'm going to put a loop just before we close. And I'm going to tab this 
in so I can see it as part of that loop. Now, how do I know when I'm done with this loop? So this loop is going to process, let's see. Oh, wait a minute. That's the wrong place. We'll put a do up there in a minute. We want it to be right here before we're reading the data. So we've got to where this data starts, and now we've got a loop that all these lines are the same. We want to process all these lines going through, bing, 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 until what? How do we know when we're done? Looking at this file, how can we know when we're done reading this, this table of data? We're processing this set of data. That's that? Yeah, we got an empty line here. And when you say empty, you mean empty. It's not a bunch of spaces. Look at it. If I try to highlight this line, there's nothing. I'm trying to highlight right arrow with this line. There's nothing there. That is a blank line. So if we just keep looping until one line is a zero length string, that's going to process the set of the set of records. So where are we doing the read here? Data one line. Oh, we're assuming that we've got the one line here. So let's put, we've read that line to get here. So at the very end of this, let's read in the next line. So here we're reading in the next line of data. And at this point, if we read a blank line, we're done. So we will loop until one line is equal to a zero length string. And that should let us out. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and bring this right up there, and I'm just going to kind of step through this. Have faith. Reading the next one, reading it out, that looks pretty good. And whilst they save, I'm going to save it, and then I'm going to go ahead and run back to the rest of the way. That should have processed that whole block. So if I think about that, the last data I should see in here, if it worked right, is that one right there. How do you say it? Louise? Is it safe with the uh, H? Louise? I don't know. Look down here. Yeah, there's the last one. That's it. So we've got the data that we're after, 113 lines. We stopped. We're feeling pretty good about it. So that we found the block, we processed the block. The only thing we've got to do now is two more things. We've got to tell it how to get to the next block and do it again. And then we've got to figure out how do we know when we're done all together. <coughs> Ultimately, we're going to end this file somehow. We've got to handle that gracefully. So, how do we get ourselves to the next location? Go back and look at our code. So right now, this is getting us, this loop here is processing the block once we've gotten it there. Now we've got to have a loop around this that keeps getting us to the next block. So if we look here, we've got something that advances us five lines. We don't need to read the days again because the days are the same for the whole file. You know, this is the fourth through the tenth, every single page of this is. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start another loop here, put a do loop here, and we'll put the end here. And go ahead and tab in everything between those two. And then all we need to do is, at the bottom of this, once we've gotten out of processing that block, we've got to get to the next norm block. We don't have to process it, we just got to get to it. And then we'll count, the loop will already count the next five lines down. And so I'm just going to come up here and take the block that says loop until you find norm. And I'm going to duplicate this right at the end of this block. So we finish processing that block, find the next norm block. Loop back up to the top of this loop, which then says counting another five lines, and now you're at the next block of data. Let's go ahead and run that. Put myself at the top of this loop. What about the loop until? Let's just clear the loop. Oh, yeah, we probably need some way to get ourselves out of this. Good thing. Uh, probably also should put like a do events in here, and this one is here as well. Save, just in case I run this and have the problem. How are we going to know when this thing is done? 
actually, we're going to run into an error. Because what's going to happen is, we're going to process the very last block of data. Let's, let's, let's kind of project ourselves to the end of this file. We're going to process this block of data. And when we're done processing that block of data, we'll get out of it. We'll, we'll hit this blank line. And then we're going to say, keep reading lines until you hit a line that says norm. Are we going to hit a line that says norm? We'll keep reading data. Are we ever going to hit a line that says norm? No, we're not. And so this is going to have an error at some point when we try to read this line. Well, let's just go ahead and run it to here and see what we get. See how well that works. This one down here, it's okay because we're going to fail in here before we... This, this, this one is going to give us an error. We'll have to deal with this and we'll see how, we'll see how we're doing. Give me an error. Row 14, station. Oh. We're hitting these equal signs. I got something, I got something a little bit off here. So let's take a look and see what we've got going on. Let's see what we've printed so we can know where we are. Oh, we haven't printed anything else. So let's think about what happened. We finished printing. We said do until we hit norm. I don't think we hit norm, do we? Come down here until we hit norm. There's the first block. Should have hit this norm right here. All right, time for us to step through this. I am going to stop my code. Let's figure out what the problem is. Uh, I want to I want to get right to this point. I'm going to break right here. So that I'm going to clear off my Excel data. This should get me through recording the data for the first block. We'll get to the one line. I want to I want to kind of walk from there and see what happens. All right. So we're doing this several times until we bump into the word norm. Run that. We'll take a peek at one line. Okay, so we're now at the next kind of station header. I, I'm hypothesizing that where I am at this point, I've come down, I've processed this block of data, I scanned down until I hit norm. I think I'm on this line right here. What I expect to happen is to move down another five lines. Let's see what happens. Back up to the top. X equals 1 to 5. That looks pretty good. What's my one line at this point? The one line is the next line I expect it to be. That all looks pretty good. Reading in my data. Maybe should do that. I'm not sure. So, so far I haven't seen many errors. I kind of expect to see the error button. We're writing these out now. I don't think I was writing them out before. I might have just had something that I hadn't, hadn't processed very well. Yeah, we're getting more data here. Go ahead and cut this loose. Ah, that's the error I was expecting. Input pass into file. So, we'll debug. I'm trying to read this, and it's saying, hey, you've read past the end of the file. There's nothing to read here. We're, we're, we're at the end. And so, in fact, if we do this, we should be able to ask for uh, input file. We should be able to ask for EOF of input file. And that tells me true. As soon as I try to read past the end of that line, it sets this flag called EOF on that file. And just tell me you, you, you're past the end of the file. So what this would allow me to do is, as soon as I read this line, every time after I read this line, I can check, am I at the end of the line? If EOF input file What do I want to do? I've gotten to the, I, 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 I've tried to read past the end of the file, where do I want to go? I can't exit the sub procedure because I have to hit this line here that closes the file. If I want to come to here. I, if I say, here's the problem, if I say exit do, it'll say, oh, you're in the do loop right here, it'll take me right to here. Exit do won't do it for me. 
What's that? Oh, this is like the only valid reason to use a go-to statement. But we use on error go-to. But it turns out you can put a label and just say, just jump to this position in the code. It's really kind of dangerous. And if you start thinking, oh, if I can only just go back there, I have to write a couple more if statements. Write the if statements. Don't just do this. But if you're nested several layers deep in the loop and you're saying, I'm now done with this whole set of loops, this is like the one thing that's okay to use go-to. I'm going to put a, a label right here. Done. Colon. That's how we say it. I'm putting a just a, any valid identifier starts with a letter, any letter, any combination of letters, numbers, underscore character with a colon. I can then jump to that like this. If eof input file, then go to done, and that will just jump right from here to there and start moving on. In fact, if I hit or just go to that line. Hit F8, it'll know what, that we're at the end of the file, it'll jump down there, and we're ready to go home. So, let me go ahead and take this comment off now. That should be the whole solution. I'll take that comment off, I'm going to clear my data out. I'm going to run my code. It's done. It's brought this data in, it's brought in 904 rows of data. Now I'll format it. And probably, if I'm really going to graph this data, I probably have to do something with trace. I'm not sure what I'll do with trace, but I probably have to address that. But in terms of bringing that data in and working with it, that's it. I'm ready to go. Questions? So, it turns out this is a fairly common thing to have to do, and it's just a matter of opening the file, getting access to the data, you probably reading the whole file in or going one at a time, and then using what you know with strings to be able to figure out key things that will let you identify that you're in the right place and pull the data out as needed. So, to the questioner who asked, you know, can't we just import this data? The answer is, it took us a while to write this, but now we've got a procedure that looks at this specific file format and brings it in just exactly where we need. All right, thanks for coming. We've got one more day of instruction. So next Monday, it will be how to automate solver, and then Next Wednesday, final exam. Remember, you can still take the final exam during the final exam period. It'll be in this room. You got the details in an email. Thanks for coming. Class dismissed.